The All Black Podcast is powered by our official cloud software partner, SAP, helping our teams in black become the best run teams in sport. To listen to this episode and all the All Black Podcasts, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Whanau, welcome to episode 9 of the All Black Podcast powered by SAP. Bledisloe Cup starts this week with the Thursday night test in Melbourne. So to talk Bledisloe Cup memories as well as his own career, we have Kieran Reid on the pod. 127 tests, 52 as captain, 34 tests versus Australia. Welcome to the pod, Rido. Hey, thank you very much. Nice to be here. How are you, mate? Very good, thanks, buddy. And uh, you know what's going on if we drop the kids off at school is the washing out are you the modern husband have you have you ticked all the jobs before we jumped on the podcast today <laughs> yeah mate got got the kids to school got everything sorted so no it's uh it's awesome actually spending a bit more time with the kids and be able to do that and in between my, my work and and other things that are happening so yeah really really enjoying that part of my life now mate are you a are you a fella who drops the kids off and then half an hour later you're still at the school gate talking you know current affairs with other parents or are you in and out you know uh, what, what's your technique no nah, i'm in and out mate i'm in and out <laughs> um yeah and this will get yeah, a few of the mums might might get hold of me now um, i'm uh yeah try and get the kids in and out as quickly as we can get back and can get over get out go for a run or get into some work so um Nice, mate. Let's have a quick warm up, like we always do. I want to get straight into it. Best and worst roommate in rugby. Um. Oh, look. Probably. So best. Um. I. Oh, most of the guys are pretty good. If I go, someone who's very similar to myself, Luke Romano. Um. Oh. Purely because uh, we're both big Lord of the Rings fans. So. Um, <laughs> We could spend hours just watching the movies, um, so filling weeks on tour that way. So he was always a good man, and he slept a lot, so that kind of worked out for me too. Um, <laughs> if I go worst, oh, look, um, for me it'd be Ben Franks. Um, <laughs> for how you know, you kind of can tell a little bit. Yeah, he's a very professional man. Loves going to the gym. You know, works really hard on everything around shakes and supplements. So. Um, you know, a 6 a.m. wake up and getting the shaker machine going and, you know, waking, the lights are on and, yeah, it didn't really um, work for me, eh, prepping for a game. <laughs> so, no, he's, he's a top man, but, yeah, as a roomie, I think he's probably one of the worst I've, I've had um, on tour. Mate, what about you? Are you clean? Are you tidy? Are you snoring? Like, what's the story? What time of roommate are you? Well, look, I guess you have to ask everyone else. <laughs> I think I'm a pretty... Um, like I wouldn't say I'm, I'm fastidious in my, in my tidiness, but I keep things fairly, um, you know, fairly in, in check. So, um, yeah, it's always – it was good, actually. I guess once you become all, a captain, you get your own room. Yeah, so beautiful. you don't have to worry about um, the others. And as you get a bit older and you've got kids, it's, it's nice to be able to ring home without having the, the roommate <laughs> listening into your conversation. So um, that, was a, that was always a, a nice perk. Like it. Mate, vicious all out there. You love a dance. You love a boogie. What gets you off the chair and onto the D floor? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do love a dance. Yeah, not anything really will get me up up there if I'm <laughs> in the right mood. But um, yeah, generally if it's um, got the instruments, so there's a yep. guitar, there's drums. Uh, so rock and roll, like I love, you know, the Foo Fighters, the Killers, um, ACDC, something like that would, you know, would definitely get me moving. Is that what's in the ears when you're running, which you're doing a lot of these days? Do you run with the iPod or are you, um, are you like Richie who, you know, is that painfully frustrating human who says he likes to hear his own feet hit the turf, which I think is the, the worst thing I can yeah. think of when I'm running. I like just to zone out and put some tunes on or something. What do you go for? Yeah, no, I'm definitely zoned out. So, yeah, I have a, a podcast. So I might listen to yourself or, or someone else. Yeah, I'll you there. Um, Nah, so listen to some podcasts or yeah, just listen to some music. So just a, a general mix. Yeah, there's nothing specific. So yeah, it'll be a bit of rock and roll, a bit of old school stuff and, and everything. So um, yeah, but definitely need something. I yeah. go running with, when I go running with with mates. Yep. Yeah. You know you can chat and, and do that, but I'm definitely uh, yeah don't want to be just pounding on the, <laughs> on, the, on on the pavement or anything. It's nice being out and about, probably in, in the forest or up some hills. So you got a bit of bit of variance in your, in your stride. Absolutely. Mate, County's big part of your upbringing. Uh, 
best counties player can't have Kieran Reid uh, to put the jersey on? Um, I'll make that's a no brainer. It's Jonah Lamu, um, 100%. You know, he is um, the man in County's jersey um, and was, you know, inspiration for me. It was, you know, it was my inspiration um, as a young fellow growing up. Mate, there's some crackers, weren't there? Like, there was some real heydays for counties. You can go right back to the Bruce Robinsons, but there's the Jonas, uh, Jolly Van Derry. Yeah. Like, there was, it was rock and roll rugby for for some of the counties teams, wasn't it? They used to chuck it around. Oh, man, it was unbelievable. So, yeah, like, so Bob Lindrum, who was an all black as well, uh, was my maths teacher at Russell <laughs> College. Um, so, yeah, rocking back to those days. And then the 90s, yeah, like my era growing up and going to Bookie and watching Jonah Joelli on the wings and, you know, the Marsh Brothers. Yeah. Um, El Pepe, man, Jim Coe, Errol Brain, yeah, it was an unbelievable Steph. side. So, um, you know, they're, they're going right this year too, which is which is good to see. Yeah, it's awesome. If it wasn't code, if it wasn't footy, what would have Kieran Reid done for the last 15 or 20 years? Yeah, look, I would have, um, I reckon I would have been a PE teacher, eh, to be honest. <laughs> um, that's what I was uh, studying towards. Um, so into sports science and would have done my teaching diploma, I think, um, and gone down that route. Probably, you know, I just love sports, so I wouldn't yep. be involved in that. And also then going, you know, helping people. So I guess that lends itself to a bit of what I'm doing now um, post my career. So, um, yeah, um, one of those P teachers, so I don't have to wear a suit or anything. Right? Oh, mate, you would have been a good scarf. you done your time down at Dunners and then and off into education. That would have been awesome. Any three people, dead or alive, for dinner and why, what would you cook? Um, oh, that's a tough question. Like I think of these guys that I looked up to, um, you know, when I was young, I think I would probably invite Nelson Mandela yep. um, and Barack Obama in terms of, I, I quite enjoy political side and, and um, the leadership of what they've done in, over history. Uh, so that's huge so for me. Um, and then maybe um, a sports star would be quite cool. So um, to mix it up, maybe Roger Federer. So um, yeah, he's he's a legend. I always love watching um, him play and the way he conducts himself. So uh, hopefully get a bit of um, good chat out of those guys. Uh, you know, if I was brave, I'd chuck a brisket on my Weber and, <laughs> and um, you know, slow cook that for, for 12 hours. But, you know, it could turn out quite badly. <laughs> so maybe just a, a lamb leg or something, I'll, I'll put it on, which makes it, I'm pretty confident in that. It's a bit easier than the brisket. So, um, yeah, a bit of a, a barbie. You know, maybe make a, a coleslaw or something and, and some chips or some mass buds. So, yeah, it'd be, it'd be a nice kind of kind of feed. Yeah, mate, sounds like you've got a few skills. Sounds like you've got a few skills. Like, I want to talk – I actually want to go straight into sort of the post-rugby stuff, like which is where you are now or have been for the last couple of years. Like, it's a pretty big thing, really. You know, when you talk to a lot of past players, like, um, you know, literally for rugby, there's yeah. a, a routine and, and a support structure uh, created for you and it's all built around – you know, doing stuff on Saturdays, you know, as the best you possibly can. How's transition been for you? And, and was that something you focused on <clears throat> while you're playing or is it something you've figured out uh, post your career? Yeah, look, now, tr- transition's been okay. Like, it, it's been pretty good and I've been very fortunate, um, you know, to be able to find my, my way without being under too much pressure financially in, in that respect. Um, you know, in terms of what I was wanting to do after the game, like, um, like I studied, so I had a little bit of stuff behind me, which was around sports coaching and um, sports science. Um, but yeah, probably it wasn't until the last few years of my career here in New Zealand, I was like, okay, what, what I genuinely want to do, which I love kind of leadership. I love helping people in that area. So I was really looking to utilize the skills I've picked up. And um, over across my career, you know, I've been coached and led by some uh, fantastic um, leaders. Um, and obviously led a lot myself and you play in these environments. So, yeah, how that was going to look, I wasn't too sure until really I finished and then so finished in Japan and came back and thought I'd have a crack at kind of creating my own business. So it's, you know, Kieran Reid and leadership and um, it is, it's going in and helping out organisations, businesses. Um, Yeah, just really excited about doing that. So, um, yeah, you can find it on my website or, or get in touch on LinkedIn and, um, just seeing where it takes me. So it's quite cool. It's, you know, it's my own thing. And um, yeah, so out of that whole structure, which is strange and quite frightening, um, but in some ways it's quite liberating as well um, right. because it gives you so much time for, for other things. So, 
totally. What is it? KieranReed.com? Like, where do we find it? Where do you get along yeah, and, and so check out? KieranReed.co.nz. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and how's, um, like, I, you know, obviously, you know, pretty awesome career. Um, you know, a big stint as, as captain of the side as well, and no doubt all sorts of skills that you're able to build up over the time. But you're taking it into different environments. Is, you know, has that been challenging? There's been some anxiety around that because obviously you were top of your game and now, you know, potentially uh, through this business and your endeavour, you know, you might be invited into some some pretty awesome companies to talk to some guys and senior management. And, you know, has that been a new challenge and something that um, almost you've needed post-rugby because, um, you know, it's, you know, getting yourself ready for, for high-performance games every Saturday is, is pretty intense and, and perhaps this new role and this new challenge is, is filling the gap of, of what you used to do in footy. Yeah, like it is. It, it gives me, it's all different each each time I go in somewhere. It's a different um, challenge, um, different people and, and things and maybe you're doing a bit more different prep for, for whatever they're, they're after. So um, that is the cool thing about it, that it's not the same, um, which is, you know, really exciting for me to do. Um, and also just trying to learn as well. So, yep. you know, I've done a lot of learning since I finished playing around leadership, reading books and listening um, to other leaders on podcasts or whatever it is. Um, and being in, in the environments, you learn so much yourself as well. So, yeah, I'm still uh, in the space where, like, I want to learn. I'm kind of one of those people that's a lifetime learner. Did that through the rugby career. But now you're in here, it's, yeah, you're, I'm still learning. It's going to, you know, see where it all ends up is, is interesting because um, I'm not too sure and I'm, I'm not um, – too fixated on what it exactly looks like um but yeah just enjoying you know how it's how it's coming together at the moment mate are you still connected uh with a lot of the guys from footy or or have you developed new connections because i know one thing you probably don't even realize it you know while you're in the game while you're in team environments like it's pretty special isn't it everyone talks about how good it is to to win a title or, or play a certain game go to a certain venue all that good stuff um you know, that I look in as a fan and go, how cool is that? But, you know, invariably when you talk to people like yourself and anyone in rugby, the thing they might miss the most or the thing they enjoyed the most was just being with the lads. You know, a group of guys with common goals, bit of banter, um, you know, that you'd literally be with those guys, you know, yeah. every week for, for the majority of the year. Have you still kept those connections or, or found ways to, um, you know, fill that gap a little bit? Yeah, it's hard. You don't get the same... You know, feel is what you did because, as you said, those are the best moments of your career. Is, is literally turning up every day with your best mates and, you know, working hard and cheering a laugh and and doing that. So no, it's it's not the same. Um, so definitely have to ch- purposely try and find those connections a bit more, which you know I, I think I can be better at. Um, you know, I've got different mates as well outside of outside of the game, which is quite cool, and you know that I run with and and that um, which is good, and then. Yeah, trying to keep keep in touch. So obviously, I know still a lot of the guys are still playing, and you kind of let them do their thing, and you catch up every now and then. But we've got a quite cool group here in Christchurch as well. That um, you know, of guys who have finished, and um, yeah, it's just about finding the time, which is which is um, you know, for men probably it's a bit harder um, to pick up the phone and chat. So um, just need to make sure I keep doing it. But it is it is one of those challenges because it was laid on the platter for so long. Um, and you didn't really um, understand how much it really meant to to you when you're in there, eh? No, totally. Mate, what sort of rugby watcher are you? Like, are you do you get down to a few Crusaders games or All Blacks games? I know you've done a bit of commentary, which is cool, but, you know, do you get animated? Do you get frustrated? Do you want to put the boots on? Like, what sort of um, what sort of rugby watcher are you? <laughs> oh, look, I can watch as a fan now, which is um, which is cool. And definitely been watching. <laughs> yeah, I, I love Love the game, so I've been watching more now than I did when I was playing, to be honest. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, and, I was, and doing a bit of work for Sky has been great because I've been at the tests this year and um, can see it live. It's different. Um, you can kind of get a better feel for, for the game. Look at watching it. I can I can watch and just you know, you know, um, kind of cheer on the guys. To be honest, like I'm not got no itch to to be out there. I'm not. Um, yeah, in any way or shape or form, wanting to be out there, I kind of look at the hits and go, "No, nah, I'm pretty happy. I'm on the other side now." So, um, it is, yeah, for me, just a, a great way just to you know stay connected to the game um, and still obviously watch and, and still feel like I know the game and I know what how things are supposed to work or how things are being done. So 
you know, there's all that, that analysis that you're doing when you're watching it. Um, you know, but that's just me as the type of person I am, you know, as a leader and a kind of person who, who knows the game. Mate, you're not in rugby anymore, and like you say, there's different things that, that connect you to it, whether it be players getting along to games, working for Sky, et cetera. But like, and we're not going to talk heaps about the running because it's, geez, it's become its own, you know, it's got its own PR machine, the Kieran Reid running and the loss of weight and all this stuff. But I, I just want to touch on, like, you're a competitive beast. Like you say, you like to learn, you like to keep challenging yourself. doesn't matter that you haven't got the boots on anymore. Is that where running's helped? Is that where even, even though it's a, it's a heap of fun, things like the Black Clash, you know, there's still competitive element to it you know there's still pride you still want to do well like are those little things that you can chuck in life to to fill the gaps a little bit or or you know keep that socially competitive element going in life because because all blokes love a bit of a challenge don't we so and i'm and i'm sure you're i mean you're you're mm-hmm. probably that's 100 percent how you're wired i'd suggest yeah definitely a competitive bugger i guess <laughs> um everyone would attest to that which you know i could think you have to be um you know but i can also put that to the side and and probably for me, the running and um, is more my well-being. To be honest, like if yeah. I don't exercise, I, you know, I feel pretty crap, and I, you yeah. know, I look at myself in a different light. Whereas if I get out and exercise, you know, every couple of days or whatever, and then um, you know, it really helps me. Um, so it gets sets me on the right path, and I'm, I'm a better person, really. So. Um, that's probably why I'm still doing that part of it. I think you are competitive in yourself, and I always am. So I try not to look at my watch and look at my times <laughs> and, and things. I just like getting out there and, and going for it. But um, yeah, the, the cricket as well is quite a cool thing. Like the Black Cash is just an awesome social occasion, I think. And um, you know, all these old fellas getting together again and reminiscing and doing something that we thought we were good at um, a long time ago. So it's um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Mate, it's it's pretty cool, and obviously you've got a great attitude to it. Like you, with the running and and stuff, you almost start again, don't you? You know, you got to the literally the top of the mountain with the All Blacks and won a couple of World Cups and and all that sort of stuff. And best on class, best on show. But you you sort of got to go back to to square one with the running. But it feels like you didn't um, see that as a barrier. You just embraced it. Just get out there and put the shoes on. Um, gets a little bit of weight off the shoulders. Probably clears the mind. Maybe we get some of your best ideas um, while you're out jogging yeah a little bit eh? like I think guys who played with me would have said there's no way I would have gone right <laughs> I, I hated it <laughs> I, I hated it I've heard um, that actually I've heard so, that Rito um, hated the intervals yeah yeah, yeah. like I, I was fine doing you know I was happy doing it on rugby field yeah you know ball in your hand or whatever um, play 80 minutes but going for a run nah don't want to do that but <laughs> it's um, it's been yeah a happy place for me so yeah um, and I struggled to start. I genuinely struggled. You know, five k was a long. You know, that was that was tough. Um, and so yeah, just build it up, build it up. And running's a, a thing that if you don't do it, your body tells you when you try and run next. So yep. it's just about consistently getting um, getting out there and, and getting into it. So, mate, it's awesome. And I wanted to. I mean, we could talk about the Black Clash. Um, you know, for ages I was there at the Mount um, for the latest one. Such an awesome event. But like. I know it's not apples for apples, but like, you know, shit, opening the batting and facing Shane Bond, um, how does that sort of nervousness or anxiety compare to running out of rugby field? Like, uh, even though, you know, Bondy's, it's been a while since he clocked 155, he's still probably bowling 100 and 135. Like, that's that's bloody quick for someone that probably got his daughter to give him a couple of throwdowns in the backyard before he went out to bat, you know? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was strange. Like, I think, um, like, I... I wasn't nervous about the whole occasion, I think, because it's, you know, it's fun, it's a social event. Um, but definitely when you run out there and you're you're facing Bondi, who is, <laughs> you know, a legend, legend. and can still yeah. whip it down. Yeah. And then he bowls near the bumper first up, you know, <laughs> straight at my head. Um, you know, you, you hope your reactions are still good enough. So, yeah, lucky enough I was able to get out of the way. But it was, um, yeah, man, you can't. There's a little bit of nerves, I guess, literally facing the pace. But yeah, once you're into it, it was just a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, the whole crowd there is amazing, actually. Yeah. And in cricket, yeah, you, you, they are looking just at you, you know. Like yeah, rugby's, yeah. you know, it's hard yeah. to pin, they don't pinpoint on one player. Whereas cricket, if you're batting, facing the ball, everyone's watching you. So it's uh, yeah, it's a, a different phenomenon, I guess. But um, yeah, it's the same thing. You're in the in the arena, you're the one doing it. Um, you kind of zone it out. 
Mate, are you pads on again? Have they put the call out yet for, for this year's edition? Are you you're back in the mix? Yeah, mate. Yeah, so I think it's it's down here in Christchurch next year in January. So it's it's mate, it's one of those ones. Yeah, always put in the calendar. So looking forward to that. So it's going to be another great day, mate. That'll be awesome. And uh, I'm sure the the cricket boys, um, you know, are, are looking for a win and want a bit of vengeance. Like, is there any rumours? I haven't heard any rumours. I'm just making stuff up. But like, a bit of a Ross Taylor or someone recently rep- retired. You know, <laughs> maybe they might. Um, yeah, get some um, of those boys in, eh? Yeah, I think that well, they might need them, eh? Those old fellas <laughs> for them lately. But um, if Ross Taylor's going to play, we'll just have to get him in our team. I think yeah. he's too he's too recently retired, so um, he'll be he'll be a good asset for us. I think. Hundred percent, mate. I want to talk to you. Go back a little bit to the early days, and and you know, it doesn't matter where we've all ended up in life. You know, probably. <laughs> Some of the most impactful experiences and attitudes and themes come from our early days, from people who are really influential. Who was it for you when you were a young man? Like who helped shape you and put a bit of time and energy into you? Yeah, I guess um, like my dad was probably one of the earliest influences around how he um, helped me out a little bit, just in terms of work ethic and stuff, and getting me out of the house to practice. And um, also, I had a teacher, James Fraser, who was. Um, at Rosal College, he was our PE teacher, helped out our first 15. You know, he was brilliant, actually. Like, he would come in early in the morning and hold tackle pads for me, just a one-on-one session with him. And wow. um, invest, he invested time with with me personally. You know, like, we as a, we were in a, a big rugby school, so what I was getting in, in terms of the team, um, you know, wasn't probably going to be enough to, to push me on to um, the goals that we had around you know, rugby and things. So, yeah, he invested time in me and invested in, um, you know, pushing me as a as a person as well. So, he was someone who really really helped me through that whole school school and years. My last few years at, at high school, mate. I, I don't know if you ever think about this or or even he thinks about this, but you know what you alluded to there, Rose Hill College, not a traditional first fifteen um, school uh, school rugby. You know, actually, got to look back that and be pretty proud that they produced. You know, one of our one of our all black captains, not just one of our all black captains, but one who did over fifty tests as captain, one of our centurion all blacks. Like, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Because often you you know they hear the narrative that that's not happening as much as it used to. So, that's actually um, something to look back on and be yeah, hugely proud of, eh? Yeah, I, I am, and I think um, you know the school certainly is, and you know like Rosa is a you know it's it's improved. Like when I was there, it was one rugby team, you know, like that was it first 15. And by the time I left, there was second 15. And I think there might've been, you know, maybe two. And then I look now and I've got, you know, maybe half a dozen. I got a woman's, I think I got a girl's team in there and awesome. stuff. So, you know, it's, um, it's That's bucking the trend, isn't it? You know, it's going the other yeah. way a little bit, which is awesome. Yeah. So it's great. And, um, look, I think, you know, there's a pathway there and I think it's, it's um, in some ways, I think coming through, a pathway of having to work really hard for things and not just being on a, you know, you know, the escalator up through different yep. schools or the right schools, um, you know, people are still there. And so I just really encourage kids who are, um, you know, at any school around the country and they've got dreams and they want to do this and, and rugby or, or whatever it is, um, you know, the, it's doesn't mean you have to can't do it from, from yes. where you are right now. It's possible way. Give Have it a crack. crack. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. I love that. I love it. Um, like you are a county's boy through and through and you know, like the, the red and black have gobbled you up. But like was that a was that a tough decision to to leave counties and go down and, and um have a crack down in Canterbury? Because I know not just around whether to change area, but you loved your cricket, you're doing pretty good at cricket, you know, you were thinking about different options with your study and career. <coughs> um yep. you know, and but actually you're you know, you took the plunge and and yeah. gave rugby a nudge. Was was that a big call? Um, oh, I guess it was in some ways, but um, you know, not not too big when you think about what Canterbury and Crusaders were at that stage. It's kind of mid two thousand, so you know, the best side in in the country um, in the NPC and really Crusaders. So um, at the time, uh, counties were still second division. It was um, so not really a chance there. Um, and really, the Blues and Chiefs weren't too interested in me, so it was kind of go where you where you wanted, you know. So yep. um, yeah, it was an awesome opportunity, and so you just grab it with two hands. And um, 
you know, certainly was, I don't know if it would have worked out differently other ways, but man, just really happy because we've got our life here now and you know, Christchurch is a, a, a great place and yeah, we've got heaps of friends and, and family, kids and stuff. So no, it's awesome. The Garden City, a beautiful place, Rido. And there's, um, but who who deserves a pat on the back or who was the one who um, thought maybe that you were worth giving a tap on the shoulder and, and trying to get down to the South Island when, like you say, maybe the Blues and the Chiefs weren't, you know, tapping your shoulder as hard? Yeah, look, I've, I've made New Zealand under-19s and yep. Ozzie McLean was the, was the head coach and he was the Canterbury coach at, at that stage. Um, and also Rob Penny, who was the academy manager at Canterbury, um, came to a couple of trials oh, yep. and might have seen me. So um, I was away at an under-19s tournament and basically kind of through that tournament, I think I was obviously playing okay. Um, and Ozzy said to me, oh, look, you'll be playing for Canterbury next year or something, well, you know, a couple of years' time or something. And I was like, oh, what are you talking about kind of thing? Um, then when we got back, um, I actually did my knee. I blew my ACL, MCL out as soon as I got back from this tournament. Yet Canterbury still came knocking and, um, and said, yep, come down and into the academy and, and things. So, um, yeah, it was Aussie. Probably set it, set it alight. And, um, yeah, from there. Um, Rest is history, yeah, mate. It is, mate. It is. Mate, I want to fast forward a little bit before we get into some of the Bledisloe Cup stuff. Like, Firstly, for the All Blacks, um, do you remember getting named in the squad for the first time? We asked most of our, our guests this who come on the show, but like it's all a little bit different for everyone. Like, Do you remember getting named? Do you remember who read it out? Do you remember where you were, all that sort of stuff? Uh, yeah, I remember exactly where I was. I wouldn't have a clue who read it out. Or I didn't hear it um, per se, but um, we'd won the NPC in, for Canterbury against Wellington 2008. Uh, so I was... And so that was a Saturday. The Sunday was my it was my birthday. Um, <laughs> so 26th of October. And so we're on the bus back to the airport to fly back to Christchurch on the Sunday morning. And I think that's when they were naming the side. So we, I think we got out of the bus at the airport. And basically that's when everyone, we didn't even listen to it on the radio, I don't think. And I, you know, so maybe it was just a few texts come in or yeah. The manager said, okay, this is the team. So it was basically unloading the bus at the airport in Wellington. Uh, we, let, we got um, told that I was, um, yeah, an All Black. So, yeah, definitely remember that. But, and were you, you know, were you, what do you reckon? Like, do you think you're a chance that everyone sort of says, oh, you know, I was surprised, but like you'd had you know, a good season for Canterbury. Did you think you're in the mix? Or Yeah, yeah it's a funny one. Like, so, um, yeah, like uh, after the Super Rugby that year, I had a reasonable season, I think. Um, a few people would pick me to get in and I didn't make it in the, the All Blacks um, and you know, I was a bit pissed off you know I was like, <laughs> um, one of those you know I was like ah. yeah. and then um, no I didn't get any comp but then Steve Hansen, Hansen rang me that next week and said you know look hey wait we want to play you to play for Canterbury um, you know and, and then we'll look at you for India tour so I wasn't like I was being told yeah, oh, I'm in the team Um but, you know, it was awesome for him to get in touch and say, look, yeah, you know, we're looking at you and, and doing this. But um, And then the night of that final, uh, Richie obviously was captain um, and he was playing that day for Canterbury. So I, I was captain in Canterbury and he was playing that day and after the final. Well, we're obviously having a few beers and celebration. Um, and he just tapped me on the shoulder and said, oh, mate, don't have too big a night. Um, so... Right, you know, yeah, I probably kind of knew from there um, that I was, uh, you know, going to be named. So, um, but pretty special anyway. I, I had kept it to myself and, um, until they named it the next day. Mate, that's also is that getting a little, um, a little comment from Rich? How good! And and next thing, that other first is when, you know, you make the team and that's amazing. And then you know, at some stage you get named in the team and you run on and and you are, you know, one thousand eighty three, um, number one thousand eighty three, yep. all black light. Same thing again. How did that come about? Um, who told you? You know, how, how did you receive your jersey? That sort of stuff. Yeah, look, I think um, when it's named, it was named. You know, at the start of Tuesday training or, or whenever it was um, back then. Um, yeah, just just name read out. You know, when they renamed the team, um, I think it's the manager. Um, but yeah, I, I can't remember specifics of that. Named it, so yeah, pretty excited. Um, 
kind of knew potentially I was going to get the run on. I think we're playing Scotland, so they changed a few guys in that team. Um, so, yeah, pretty exciting playing number six. Um, and had a couple other debutants. So, Liam Messon was playing eight. Yeah. And Jamie McIntosh was okay. starting as, as well, I think, um, at props. So, um, all three of us were debuting. Um, and, yeah, you get your jersey day off the game. So, in the afternoon, um, about three o'clock, you go and and uh, there's no real ceremony, really, I think. But it was, you always go to the manager's room and he'd shake your hand and give you the jersey. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of how where we got got your first jersey, went back to the room. And, you, yeah, yeah, pretty special. You're kind of mulling over it a lot, <laughs> um, staring at it for a while. Um, obviously, making sure it's real. And, yeah, so it's um, a pretty cool day. And then, so debuting at Murrayfield, Scotland. Yeah. And my parents managed to fly over for the game. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, absolutely amazing kind of time, I guess, to, to go through. Yeah. And where is it, mate? Is it on the wall in the background there somewhere or has it got another pride of place or is it tucked away in the drawer? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's sitting there ready to go up on the wall some, <laughs> at some point. But no, I haven't got it framed yet. So, um, yeah, we'll um, get to that. I was waiting till I finished my career. Now I have. Now I still have to go and put them up. So yeah, I'll do that some stage. Mate, I want to ask you a question. I haven't heard you talk a lot about around because it's it's topical. It's even today. You know, like we've got Artie playing eight, who's a seven. You know, back in the day, Michael Jones went from seven to six. I've seen David Pocock play eight. Like from what I can see, the majority of your career, it's certainly at the start, you played six. You know, you're a blindside flanker, and it's where you did a lot of your stuff. And then, obviously, after a little bit of time in the All Blacks, you came across to eight. Like, how did that come about? Was that an easy transition? Was that seeded with you for a long time? Rito, we want to get you into eight at some stage, or, or actually, it was we need an eight. Here we go. Um, yeah, I, well, I think I was looked at as a, as a number eight. Um, I probably wasn't confident enough in my own ability as a youngster to say I could play it. I think eight is definitely a specialist position. Um, you know, and, and, and what you need to, to play there. Um, and you're involved a lot more, whereas at number six, I think you can, you know, you can be that workhorse. Yep. You know, you perhaps don't touch the ball as much. Um, you know, just doing a lot of selfless acts. Um, and it's different now a little bit to what it was um, when I first started. Um, so, yeah, I was a six, and basically a six for Canary. Like we had Mossy Toilette playing number eight for the Crusaders. So, naturally play six when he's playing um and then um so for the all blacks i came in at number six obviously because that's what i played um and then really I, I played number eight for the first time at the highest level yeah for the all blacks <laughs> i had to play for the crusaders at number eight really i played a season for canterbury uh when moss was was injured um at number eight um but i've been working on it so rob penny and things all through academy i was working on my number eight skills and um, yeah, just got to the point where uh, Steve Hansen always thought I was a number eight, um, and Rodney Soale was obviously the incumbent when I first came in, um, and so learned a little bit off of him um, for my first kind of year. So I'd, um, where I was kind of coming off the bench a bit, um, and then yeah, got the opportunity to play. I think my first game was in Sydney at, at starting number eight. Um, and yeah, we're kind of from there, I you look didn't back. really play anywhere, anywhere else. So, um, it kind of fitted the mold for my skills, for, for how I played the game and, and for the team as well. So, um, yeah, it was, it was cool. Awesome, mate. It is Bledisloe Cup this week. We've got the Thursday night test match, which is a bit of a blast from the past to, to playing a midweek game. At, you know, if you really want to dig into the archives, you know, there's the Gregan tackle, which was a Friday night game, I think. Maybe a Thursday, I'd have to look it up. But what's your, before you got in the, the black jersey yourself, what's your early memories <coughs> of the, the Bledisloe? You're probably like me, like the for a long time when we were young, you know, South Africa um, weren't involved. So those matches with Australia, you know, were a, were the ones that we really looked to. What was it like for you? What are your memories of Bledisloe Cup games or Australian games growing up? Yeah, look, for me, I think it's um, probably the late 90s, I guess. Um, early 2000s, so not great memories. Yeah, a tough <laughs> um, period, wasn't it? But, yeah, so, well, 
the memories for me were were Aussie would always snatch it right at the end with a try like Toto Kefu, I think, scored a try under the post one game. Um, John Eels, obviously. Um, penalty in Wellington. Penalty uh... in Wellington. Um, so, yeah, kind of those, that three or four year period of just low like, and so it was a real thing um, for me watching it, you know, with a little bit of hatred for the May because they were really good. <laughs> yeah. um, but obviously, the amazing, like that 2000 game. At the Olympic Stadium, where Jonah scores off Tane Randall's little yeah. um, pop over the top, like I've watched that heaps of times. Amazing game, um, yeah. So that kind of my memories, probably as you know, a young guy as, as the Aussies doing pretty well. Um, yeah. And then yeah, until kind of we got it off, and I guess. And so uh, one of my greatest, uh, you know, I think it's pretty awesome that I went through my career and still still had it over the the whole time. So absolutely. Yeah. I sort of I wanted to touch that on that a little bit, and it's something maybe I've heard a couple of your teammates talk about. One of the reasons we're able to have some success against Australia over you know the last wee while is actually because people like yourself had an upbringing of of watching Australia being really strong, taking it in the last minute, having the Bledisloe Cup for a long time. So there's actually a lot of respect there, and so when the Bledisloe Cup got into our position, and when those games came around, there was no taking it easy. Like you, you boys had a real focus on that and had a real pride in retaining that cup? Yeah, I think so. I think the cup became quite a, you know, it was a really important um, piece of silverware for us. So it was really motivating in itself, you know, which you don't really have in any other, you see it, a lot of the other teams we play against have a cup, but it's not the his, history of what the Bledisloe Cup means, you know, like over, well, it must be close to 100 years now, or is it? Um, so, yeah, it's um, a very special thing. And also, from my point of view, every time you looked at the Aussie team that they named, it was so full of talent. Like, um, they're such a great team, like on paper and stuff. So you had the respect of what they could do. Um, and they, you know, there was sometimes the puzzling thing is that they didn't often put it out in the field when we played them, you know? And it's like, but like you prepared as if they were going to put out their their best game, which when they did, you know, they, they beat us a few times. And, um, so yeah, definitely that respect of knowing what could could be coming um, our way um, really really drove us, and the Bledisloe Cup was a big part of it. Mate, for you, highs and lows. Can you remember? Is there a, a favourite game or mo- moment, and also a you know perhaps one that that got away? You, you had some success, but there were some games you dropped. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a couple of losses, which you know they're all over the ditch there, which. Um, which really hurt. Um, probably my, my last one in Perth. Well, it wasn't my last game against the Aussies, but we got we got pumped. So that was uh, not a great memory to hold on to. Um, and but the one that probably hurts more was I think 2012. I think it was Kevin Mealami's hundredth test, um, and we either drew or we lost by a point. I can't remember. I think it was a draw. Um, and it was yeah, just kind of one of those ones where. A great man of Kevy, hundred tests, and and we couldn't uh, couldn't get the win for him. Um, so yeah, that one kind of hurt. Um, and wins, I, I think for me, probably the twenty eleven World Cup final, uh, the semi final. Yeah. Um, yeah, that win was was pretty cool. It kind of felt because um, we'd just been tipped up by them in Brazil um, a handful of weeks before the World Cup, and. Um, yeah, so to get them there and, and the scoreboard didn't really show up, but we just absolutely dominated them. So it was um, yeah. a really, really cool game to be a part of. I was at that game and it was probably unrivaled atmosphere in New Zealand. I don't think I've sort of, there was a, you know, there was there was tension because yeah. they beaten us a few weeks earlier. It was a World Cup semi final. You know, we had a good side, but we knew that they were dangerous and, and there was some, you could sort of cut the air sort of stuff like it was probably. It's probably the loudest I've heard a, a New Zealand crowd because I reckon compared to overseas crowds, sometimes maybe we're a little bit more reserved. But on that night, um, there was sort of a, a 16th man. You know, the crowd was getting right into it. Yeah. Oh, mate, it was. And so, yeah, it was. <laughs> it certainly started from the first whistle, that, that crowd that day. Um, but it was more, yeah, that whole World Cup was fantastic. And as you said, I think... Um, you know, when you watch rugby overseas, you get a lesson and a little bit of how to support your team and, and how vocal a lot of other countries are, um, which which perhaps we're not as as much. But that, that World Cup, we were just phenomenal to see the support 
you know, hanging out on on outside to see us get on the bus at the hotel or at, at the grounds was so so amazing. Um, and as you said, so loud and um, just gave us such a big lift. So no, it was uh, it was fantastic. Mate, 34 test matches against Australia. That's a hell of a lot. For you, um, you probably forged some pretty good relationships with, with those guys over the years. Like, There's some players of note from an Australian perspective that you know, you particularly would worry about or prepare for, um, you know, whether there's some, or even just maybe some really good relationships you have with those guys through playing them, playing against them for so long. Yeah, it was, um, it's a lot of tests. It's actually the relationship through the period where I was there. <laughs> I don't think it was as good as what, you know, it, it probably should have been really. Like no, it's it was, all Colsey's fault, I'm told. Yeah. Anyway, it's all Dane Coles' well, fault, I'm told. Yeah, well, maybe. Well, here's a bit later, but you know, like yeah. Deansy went in, and, yes, you yeah. know, 2008 when I first kind of came in. Um, that's right. So there's tension around that. Then obviously, Checker came in and he's got his way of running things, yeah. Um, and his teams, so yeah, I like it. Like we fully tension. respected of, of who they were, but you know, we didn't probably have the same close social bond as what we had perhaps with the South African teams. Yeah, um, we you know, we'd go as hard on the field and then maybe enjoy each other's company off the field. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit sad in that respect because yeah, every Aussie you meet, you kind of, you know, they're kind of like Kiwis yeah. really around the world when you when you catch up. So, um, but definitely if you looked at their team through that period when I was there, Dave Pocock was, it would stand out as a person, you know, for us as a team to really target because of how good he was. Um, you know, he could turn the game, you know, when he was on and just win turnover after turnover was, um, unbelievable how how good he was in that area at the breakdown. Um, Israel Falau yeah. um, is just a, a freakish player for you know he's my size or bigger than me and able to do what he can do out in the in the field. So um, yeah, so when we defended the Aussies, like we were, you know, you're more scared of what they could do with the ball than a South Africa or something. South Africa are pretty blunt; it they're just going yeah. to run straight at you. Aussies will will pass the ball and step round you, you know, like, so it was more of a threat for, for us, you know, with them. Mate, um, I remember coming along yeah. to All Blacks training, I think you had, I can't remember who was playing there, but you, you were bibbing up a couple of the, the guys in the opposition and literally the red bib was Pocock, you know, like in the opposition, it was like, right, playing like he was, as soon as that red bib was anywhere near the ruck, you had to clean him out. I remember one time Rich talking a little bit about um, putting tactics in place, like actually getting him to make a lot of tackles, so that the so maybe wasn't as likely to be able to get on the ball. Like, was that the sort of stuff you guys would talk about for guys like that, and try and have you know particular tactics for particular people you you know you you were most worried about and respected? Yeah, there would be certain certain guys. Like, I don't think we'd you know um, certainly Pocock was one of those guys. Um, the guys who are good good over the ball, you definitely target. Um, in general sense, though, like we're looking at the team game plan. Um, but yeah, Pocock was one that you knew um, if he was anywhere around the ball, he's going to have a sniff and generally if he gets his hands on it, he'll win it. So uh, making him tackle. So if he's on the ground, he obviously can't, you know, can't be in that position. So um, that worked for us. Um, and they have a few other guys like that as well, like Michael Hooper yeah. now. Um, so I, awesome to get to know him. I played with him in Toyota up in Japan. Um, and for going, you know, how for leather against each other for so long without, you know, exchanging a few pleasantries at the coin toss and things like that. Um, just get to know him outside of the game and um, yeah, which was was awesome. And is he cool is he even of... potentially a good man, Rido? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, like Michael Hooper is a good man. Oh, he's a top man. Yeah, he's a top <laughs> man. So, you know, like we've you know we talk to each other, chat, you know, text each other every now and then now, nice. and it's um it's cool, you know. So yeah, you realise. Rugby players are, are pretty good buggers, really, aren't they? So, um, no matter what jersey they're wearing. Um, so, no, it's, uh, yeah, he's, he's a really good man and could get his psyche as well around, you know, talking to him about what it was like potentially facing us and, and, and all that as well. 100%. Mate, we've got a Thursday game. Ten days later, we've got a game at Eden Park. Uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions, predictions from Kieran Reid, former skipper. What do you reckon? Oh, look, I think it's going to be a great couple of games as <laughs> history's shown us through this championship, you know, like uh, no one's gone back to back yet. Yeah. So that that's gonna win the championship. It's gonna whoever goes back to back will win it, um, won't they? So 
Um, I think they'll be the All Blacks after, hopefully, after last week. Um, but you can't take anything for granted. I think um, the Aussies have been pretty, pretty good. I think they do miss Hooper. Um, you know, with him not being there, um, and perhaps a couple injuries with their first fives and stuff, so uh, might limit them a little bit, give us the advantage. So um, it's a quite exciting thing, you know, to, to be watching it and um, not know it's a foregone conclusion, you know. So um, yeah, I think the All Blacks will, will get up and win both those games. Awesome. Kieran, our partners at SAP pride themselves on powering the best run teams. Kieran, during your time in rugby, do any common success factors stand out? Um, oh, look, I think for us, it was um, created like a really good routine, I, I think, in the All Blacks. Um, my time there, our weeks were really well prepared. We were really well planned. So um, it gave us the best opportunity to go out there and perform on, on the weekend. Um, so that was down to our trainings, down to, um, you know, our social side, times to connect off the field. Um, yeah, and, and the process we had around around our, all our preparation, I think, gave us a, you know probably our, our best chance. Uh, I think that definitely, you know, to get it right on the weekend, get the form, you got to you got to prepare right, and that, that certainly helped us our, our routines in that in that area. Mate, whether it's because I know you love your sport, whether it's a sports team or individual that you admire, or, or maybe someone um, that you got to go in and see their environment or have a chat to them, do you? Is there any other? Uh, sports teams or individuals that you respect as being really high performing? Oh, it's plenty, mate. Yeah, there's heaps, <laughs> heaps around the world that um, you look at and, and you go, wow, they're pretty impressive in what they do. Um, yeah, I, I would love to, you know, look into a bit more of kind of, um, you know, a bit of the football. Um, so, uh, like Liverpool, obviously pretty good at the moment. Um, even like Gareth Southgate would be cool to, um, see what he's done with the England football team. Um, and then, yeah, I, I'm happy to, I'd love to have conversations with plenty of yeah. great sports people, mate. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's always nice to hear perspectives in, in that case. Mate, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, uh, giving us a bit of insight to your career and also um, a bit of a chat about, um, you know, that, that wonderful tradition between New Zealand and Australia. What, what's the go, mate? Is it time to go put the running shoes on now and, and go for a trot or have you already got that in? Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Bit of work today, um, but maybe I have to get out for a try at some point today or tomorrow. Mate, what's, is there a to-do list from the misses on the wall? Are you, are you a handy man or are you, or are you sort of a, a, a get a guy in? Um, I say <laughs> I'm a handy man, but generally then it, it, it doesn't get done and then there's a guy that gets brought in. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's probably that way. My wife would definitely tell you that anyway. <laughs> Mate, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, um, yeah, look look forward to um, seeing you on Sky with your analysis again and appreciate you giving us our time today. Cheers, mate. Yeah, no worries at all. Thank you. The All Blacks podcast is powered by our official cloud software partner, SAP, helping our teams in black be the best run in sports. Hosted by Rob Dunn in the Hargrave Street Studio. Produced by Carl Thompson from Blue and Ginge, the podcast producers. Video editing by Mac Leesberg, graphics by Western Design, content advising from Andy Burt, and commercial manager for the podcast is Valeska Hoth. Follow the All Blacks podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and anywhere you get your podcasts.